see. Okay. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, I think I shall begin this with a little uh, crass commercialism. <clears throat> I just wrote a textbook called Energy, a textbook, uh, for a college class for which uh, college algebra is not a prerequisite. Um, but the book is loaded with arithmetic, and uh, I expect that uh, it, it will actually do pretty well. So uh, you have an ad for it there. Uh, I brought something like 20 copies with me, and uh, I've already sold a few to some hapless folks. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, we'll talk about the uh, pitfalls of renewable energy programs and uh, we'll call it uh, Adventures in Reality Land. Now there is a take home message, which I will repeat later, but it's very important to understand that no conventional power station anywhere in the world has been closed down because of solar or wind. They are supplemental programs. Uh, sometimes they're adequate, or, you know, sometimes they do some good, most often, they uh, line their owner's uh, pockets with money from uh, other ratepayers and taxpayers and so forth. Uh, speaking of the dream world, <clears throat> Amory Lovins uh, had this idea that uh, he was writing, writing this about 1975, uh, th there would be a takeover that uh, the total amount of energy used in the United States uh, would increase uh, until about 1985 or 1995 or 2000 and then decrease and by uh, 2025 uh, soft technologies uh, would take over and it didn't happen. In uh, 1978 uh, Ralph Nader said everything will be solar in 30 years the Union of Confused Scientists <laughs> uh, projected that uh, by the millennium end, being 2000 or so, uh, wind farms will provide 0.68 quads of electricity. Uh, they're actually off by 94%. Uh, direct solar would give us 0.6 quads, and the actual amount was uh, 87% less. Uh, here is the director of the Lincoln Labs at MIT. He predicted by, uh, by let's see, about turn of the century, I guess, by 2010, the U.S. would generate between 750 and 1,500 gigawatts, or 10 to 20 percent uh, of our electricity, I guess, from direct solar by the year 2010. Well, uh, we're having, this is adventures in reality land. At the top uh, graph there, this is the amount of uh, annual energy consumed. I put it in exajoules because I like the metric system. But, uh, pretty much an exajoule is a quadrillion BTU within 5% or so. Uh, anyway, uh, there's a plot there going from about 1975 up to the present. Eh, you know, it's increasing, it's kind of holding off there. There's the uh, recent. Um, uh, decline in the economy showing up quite adequately there. Coal, oil, and natural gas, uh, which Mark recently just showed as, um, as fossil fuels, hanging in there. And way down at the bottom, I make a little, little bit different distinction between things than, than Mark did. I put wood and hydro together because wood was historically uh, our uh, big energy source. And hydro was a historic energy source since about 1800 or so, 1850, I should, no, by around 1900. Wind and solar, uh, get out your magnifying glasses, please. Uh, <clears throat> here is a plot of the U.S. energy uh, consumption f f dating back to 1635. That data is available. Now, this is a logarithmic plot. You all know that a logarithm is a system used by a Catholic lumberjack to control the size of his family. Uh, each horizontal line in there uh, represents 
a, uh, a factor of 10 above the uh, previous one. Or in fact, that particular length represents a factor of 10 anywhere you put it on the graph, as for example, between 5 and 50, so forth. So we've uh, increased our consumption uh, quite a number of factors of 10 since 1635. Well, the population has increased too. So what we like to plot here is the actual per capita annual energy consumption. And it, this, I, this graph goes back to somewhere in the 1700s or so. Uh, from up to about 18, uh, well, let's see, uh, or somewhere around 1900 or so, uh, that figure doubled. And presently, we're using somewhere around three, three and a half times as much energy per capita as our ancestors did in, say, 1800. Remember that. If you don't believe it, go calculate it, because some turkey is going to disagree with you. Get the numbers. Really. They, they, they don't believe it, because, the, well, anyway, it is true. But here's the, dif the, dis the difference here. In 1800, there were no cars, trains, airplanes, uh, electric toothbrushes, uh, iPhones uh, supported by uh, vast data centers and all that sort of stuff. Yet we only use three to three and a half times as much energy per capita as our ancestors did. Well now, <clears throat> how has all that occurred? We've had uh, terrific Im improvements in a number of things. For example, uh, domestic heating used to be done with fireplaces, and if you had a good Count Rumford fireplace, which most Americans did not, uh, the British thought it was really great, they were about 9% efficient. We now have furnaces that are 90% efficient. Uh, engines, if we go back to the uh, first uh, engines that were used to pump uh, water out of coal mines, had an efficiency of about a half a percent. And we're up to over 60% with combined cycle uh, gas turbines. Um, <clears throat> lighting, we've gone from, I like to point this out, whale oil lamps and candles and that sort of thing. We've gone up to 60, per, or, I mean, sorry, we're up to 100 lumens per watt. I'll show you a graph on that in a moment. Um, we've gone from electromechanical relays in the telephone system to transistors. In fact, the uh, Bell Labs uh, hired away the uh, good physicists at uh, MIT Radiation Lab who are using solid state detectors for radar detection. And they said, can you make something that will uh, replace those electromechanical relays that gobble up a lot of power? Well, they invented the transistor and got the Nobel Prize. Uh, we've gone from uh, heat-consuming uh, vacuum tubes to CMOS, that's complementary metal oxide semiconductors that are used in computers and so forth. And uh, all that stuff is driven by economics because, as Mark said, uh, uh, efficiency means saving money. And occasional brilliance. One guy has a bright idea, one gal has a bright idea, it gets spread out and saves a lot of people a lot of money. <clears throat> Here's an example of the kind of efficiency increase that uh, has gone since, uh, since 1880s or so. Uh, candles and whale oil lamps are so inefficient they don't even show up on the graph. But time goes on and people have gotten to be more efficient. You see, that is why we use uh, so much, uh, so, so very little more energy per capita than our ancestors did. Another example is railroads. Um, the, that horizontal line in there at the, with the red arrow there represents one pound pushing one ton on the railroads. One pound pushes one ton, and depending upon the curvature of the track, uh, you're, you can be mostly under that. Um, in 1876, a guy uh, wrote, a, wrote a, an article and pointed out that um, uh, there's enough sunlight reaching the Earth above the atmosphere to melt a layer of ice over the Earth 30 meters thick every year. 
that doesn't happen because we live in the balance. There's a, you know, there's energy coming in, there's energy going out. So the advantages of the renewables are the huge amount of sunlight running start and the plants grow by themselves and so forth, and yet they're only about 9.3% of our energy. And a, most of that are, uh, most of that contribution comes from bioliquids, which means uh, Brazilian uh, ethanol and wood and hydro and between uh, solar and PV, they're 1.38% of all energy. That's a little bit less than some of those people predicted. If you look at the electricity only, we're simply going to ignore solar and PV because they don't amount to anything. Uh, there's not much chance for improving hydro, wood, or bioliquids. Um, and the wind uh, gives us 3% of our electricity. So we're going to concentrate on wind. I want to mention five problems, which I will show right here, and then discuss, except I'm not going to discuss the environmental stuff. We don't want to talk about dead birds. Um, here's the power curve. Now, these power curves are generic. For General Electric and Vestas, uh, the amount, the fraction of energy of the, of the wind that they ex extract follows that curve right there. Um, and here is the problem with it. You see, suppose we have 10 mile, 10 meter per second wind speed, and it increases, that nine, I guess, increases to 10. That's about a 10% increase, but it's a 30% increase in power. That leads to uh, vast fluctuations in the power, and you're trying to maintain a steady power line. That's kind of what the fluctuations in power look like. That's averaged over 104 wind turbines spread out over half the countryside, okay? Uh, this is from ERCOT in Texas, uh, occasional phase failure. Um, uh, the, the bottom curve in there is the wind power and scale to the one on the left, which is total power, it's up by a factor of 10 or something. But in any case, uh, what you notice is that in many cases, uh, the demand is highest when the power is the lowest and conversely, especially it happens in uh, uh, Hawaii where the biggest demand for electricity is when the sun goes down and the Kona winds go down. Okay, uh, the capacity factor is something that's simply a matter of design, but uh, you can get, a, the present devices are made for a capacity factor of about 35%. You have to space out the wind turbines and proportional to the diameter. If you double the diameter, you get four times the power, but you have to put them twice as far away in both directions. And what that amounts to is the power per unit area is independent of the size of the turbine. And uh, basically, to, uh, to get a gigawatt year-round average, you have to have something like 300 square miles of land area in very good territory. There's another problem called the wind gradient. The wind is higher at higher speeds and decreases as you go down. Well, that in, uh, induces a torque, uh, which actually tries to turn the wind turbine on you. And that's just of a gyroscopic effect, not a lot of fun. And then when the wind actually changes direction, then the torque is such to do this to the wind turbine or uh, the other way around can go down. Some RPM problems, you're trying to turn about 15 RPM of a wind turbine into several hundred RPM or several thousand RPM to generate 60 hertz. So they have got these speed up gear boxes and that's the weak spot and that is what can happen. And you can imagine what it's like when several, well let's see, 50 tons of stuff falls to the ground, that's just the stop part. So again, your take home message is uh, there's no conventional power station in the world that's been closed because of solar or wind. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>